live. Are we good? Okay. Hey, we're live. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore. And uh, it is uh, always a, a real treat and an honor to have Walter Mosley joining me today, uh, virtually via Zoom, uh, the ubiquitous platform that we're all watching these days. Um, let me just give you a, a quick formal intro here, Walter. Um, there's so much to say here. Uh, uh, Walter Mosley is one of America's most celebrated and beloved writers. A grand master of the Mystery Writers of, of America, he has won numerous awards, including an Ed, Edgar for Best Novel, an Annisfield Wolf Book Award, a Grammy, Penn America's Lifetime Achievement Award, and several NAACP Image Awards. Uh, his books have been translated into more than 20 languages. Mosley's short fiction has appeared in a wide array of publications, including The New Yorker, GQ, Esquire, The LA Times, and Playboy. And his nonfiction has been published in The New York Times Book Review, The New York Times Magazine, Newsweek, and The Nation. Uh, he's the author of the acclaimed Easy Rollins series, including most recently Charcoal Joe. And I also wanted to say that um, Mr. Mosley is a, what I would consider, uh, a true man of letters uh, in the old sense, you know. Uh, so, Walter, it really is an honor to have you join me today. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And um, first of all, before we get on to the books and stuff, how are you doing in this in these strange times that we find ourselves <laughs> in? You know, I mean, really, honestly, you know, you're like a, you're you're always on the verge of something. But you know, I'm I'm in L.A. I have an apartment. It's the, I'm on the seventh floor. I look out over the ocean. Uh, you can't beat it. I mean, it's where I am is beautiful. And I, and I know a lot of people have a, a great deal of, of, of problems, you know, because their life has been, you know, I get up in the morning, I go, you know, to school, I go to work, I do that thing, I come home. You know, there's that notion. But, you know, as a writer, as an artist, as whatever I am, uh, I'm actually used to being home uh, doing my work. I just pile it up all over my house. And I said, well, okay, now I'm going to do my drawings. Well, now I'm going to do my writing. Well, now I'm going to do my, you know, internet, whatever. And and so it, it's it's all been fine with me so far, you know. I mean, I haven't, you know, started choking or dying yet, so. So you're not exactly uh, like David Geffen on a yacht out in the Caribbean, but... Uh... Looking out over the yeah. ocean in Santa Monica isn't bad, is it? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, that would be nice to be in a yacht on the Caribbean, but, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm a little more pedestrian than that, you know? It's like, at some point, you know, you know, it, I, I remember when I was a little kid, you know, um, watching, you know, reading about the czar, you know, in Russia and about the revolution, about how, like, you know, they, they killed everybody, not because they did anything particularly, but because, you know, they posed a threat. You know, I don't want to be that guy. Right. <laughs> you right. know, it's like, I'm like in my house. I'm looking at the water. You know, somebody gets mad at me. I say, okay, you know, listen, I'll, I'll leave. You know, but, uh, you know, so there's uh, there's there's different ways to be, right? And you're you're out in L.A. Um, you're doing some, we're doing some TV projects. Is that right? I'm still uh, finishing, well, I'm finishing a, a, a this season of Snowfall for, for FX, which is, you know, John Singleton's, you know, the thing about I mean, about the, the crack epidemic in in the, in the mid '80s in, right. in Los Angeles. Right. I'm also also writing, um, uh, starting to write a, a series uh, about uh, based on my, uh, you know, a mini series based on my my book, uh, uh, The Last Days of Ptolemy Gray. Oh wow. Uh, Sam Jackson has, you know, has has agreed to star in it. Is that right? Uh, wow, that's yeah. fantastic. So I'm I'm working on that, and there's a couple other things, you know. This and that. You know, it's funny. Uh, I was talking to you just for a minute before we started about, um, you know, how much I love your your recent book, John Woman, and uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, you mentioned Ptolemy Gray, and um, you know, as much as I love your series that you do, I, mean, I love Easy Rollins, like everybody else, and uh, you know Leonid McGill, which we'll get into. But I must admit, my first love is your edgy, interesting, bizarre, standalone work. I love, you know, The Man in My Basement, uh, you know, books like that. Um, and I was going to ask you about uh, 
Let's talk about the ancient Greeks for a minute. Um, okay. <laughs> they seem to be, you're not shy about it. They, they're, they're really at the background of, of so much of what you do. Uh, is, would that be a, an accurate assessment? Well, it's interesting, you know, I mean, the, the uh, connecting with, with, with the ancient Greeks and what they did and later on the Romans, but that if you, if you ask the, the, the major uh, spokesman of ancient Greece, um, which is Aristotle, who was the most important thinker or who were the most important thinkers before him, he would say the Egyptians. You know, and I think because he said that, everybody else says, "Well, Egypt really isn't part of Africa, but it is." You know, and you know, African thought, African thinking, um, you know, becomes a really important part of, of history. And and the Greeks are basically the translators of that. You know, so I I, I can't, you know, I, I love it. You know, I love Socrates. You know, before Aristotle, of course, and I have my book, the Socrates series. Uh, and I I I I I love you know that where people could actually think about the world in a way that's so advanced that people still today are using the, the language. You know, for instance, Adams, for instance, mm -hmm. come from the ancient Greeks. You know, I, you know uh, uh, the dialectics, you know, of, of, of politics and of drama come from the ancient Greeks. Um, the, the idea that, that talking is a way to understand your world, which is certainly a Freudian way of looking at things, you know, comes from Socrates. And, and everything comes out of Socrates, really, you know. It's kind of wonderful. I, I, I love their thoughts, their thinking. You know, I know Toni Morrison did also, you know. And, uh, you know, I think the you know, Tony's you know, work kind of stops with the Greeks. And, and, you know, but I kind of love how far they reach back from there. And then you've got, uh, uh, well, tell us a little bit about, about kind of a little bit more about John Woman. Let's get into that book because since you weren't here last year and we weren't able to talk about it in person, can you just uh -huh. tell me a little bit about what inspired that book and how you came to write it? And it's a very, very complicated. You know, it's a book of ideas, yet it's a, uh, it's got Edgar Allan Poe, Th Thucydides, all kinds of different elements going into this book. Uh, mm. Yeah. I, I wanted to write the book, you know, I, I wanted to write, you know, you know, the, the idea of being deconstructionist, you know, which is a very kind of like later 20th, early 21st century way of thinking. It's like, I, you know, you may have an idea and you might want to present it to me, but I can deconstruct that idea and fit it into the world in different ways that, you know, you weren't able to do, let's say. That's, you know, that's what the deconstructionists say. Uh, most things that the deconstructionist approach in my understanding don't work like I'm gonna deconstruct this painter no you're not gonna the painter did the painting the painting is there you could deconstruct it but it's there you know it, anything that you add will be different one of the few studies that really fits deconstructionism is history because we don't understand history we don't know history we want to pretend that we do. We take little moments, you know, well, Abraham Lincoln went here and the, and the John F. Kennedy went there and Joseph Stalin did this, you know, but, but in the end, we don't really understand what happens. There's nothing, there's no way that we can explain our experience. And so I decided I wanted to write a book about a deconstructionist historian, a person who realized that I will never completely understand history, that trying to understand history can only end up as being an art you know and i and i so i take my character john woman <clears throat> and, and and try to make him a person who deals uh, with with his own history and with the history of his world his people uh his culture his language and and, and in, in the middle of it he, he has a revelation that hey i'm a sociopath you know, being able to, to approach history in the way that I'm doing it, I have to be sociopathic. I, I can't believe in anything, you know, my morality. And so, and so following that character, you know, through, through like, you know, just the story of his life, just to, you know, the, like, okay, I was a kid. I had this wonderful father who was, a, who was genius. I had this mother who I loved passionately, but who couldn't really be a mother. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, and in the end, I go out into the world and I and I use what I learned from them in order to you know be be a professor in a place that puts me in a position that threatens my life, but I have no choice. I have to do it anyway. I, I just like it made me so happy to write that book. And it's uh, it's funny because you know uh, the father uh, works in a in a silent film theater that mm -hmm. has been you know continuously in, in operation since I think you, 1911. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested in, in you know why a silent film theater. Uh, did you have a? Or it was just something that came to mind. Well, I think that yeah, I mean it was something that came to mind, and, and that theater existed in New York. It also exists in L.A. up on on Fairfax. You know that the, the few silent film theaters that you know that that understand that art. Uh, and I, and I and I think that you know that every art, every expressive art, uh, you know that, that deals with language and images, uh, deals with what John Woman is trying to do. Um, I, I, and and so I, I guess that it, it it was kind of wonderful that this guy who was an you know John knows more about history than John Woman, and more than he ever will, but he taught him everything that he could possibly teach him, and. He, his 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 commitment to this theater, not that he wanted to be committed to this theater, it's just that he couldn't do anything else. Yeah. Um, but his knowledge of not only the films that are shown, but the history of the films that are shown, uh, you know, ancient, you know, like old uh, 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 silent films from Russia, old silent films from China. You know, he knows he knows everything, and he knows what people were trying to do. With, with these movies, you know, and, and it, it becomes a, it's a wonderful thing. It's not really what he was set up for. John's father is set up, you know, to, to know history and to, and to read history and to believe in, 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 in who we are and what we are and what we were and to understand really strongly that we can never be able to say who we are and where we come from, but we can only gesture toward that now. And so him, you know, him, I, I, I don't know, I, it, it felt good to me that, well, for the world, his mastery was, the, was silent film. But for John, his son, his mastery was the history of knowledge. And um, I know I've, I've talked to you before, and you know, I don't think you work with a roadmap when you're writing. Uh, did, did the book, uh, and then we'll, we'll get on to uh, Trouble is What I yeah. Do and other things, but... Um, you know, the, where Cornelius the kid in John Woman, there's a point, a specific point, where the narrative shifts, you know, when his father finally passes away. And then the book mm -hmm. changes and becomes very different. And he, mm -hmm. uh, he kind of transforms into this, this other character, John Woman, you know, set out here in the Southwest somewhere in a really interesting um, yeah. university setting. Um, did you have in mind kind of where you were going to go with Cornelius when you started this book? Or were you just kind of feeling along and said, okay, this is... I remember how excited you were when you were here a year and a half ago, and you're like, yeah, I've got this new book coming out called John Woman. And I, I just remember how excited you were and enthusiastic yeah. about it. I Listen, I worked on the book for 20 years. I kept trying to write it. I kept trying to write it. I kept trying to understand it. I kept trying to do stuff with it. I, kept, I, 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 and, and I would stop. But I had the part where you know where Cornelius and his father were you know dealing with each other, and he was becoming this 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 being, but he hadn't you know he hadn't gelled yet. He hadn't solidified. But I I didn't know how I was going to follow it through, and um, and then one day I said, well listen, I'll just outline it. You know, because when I do mysteries, very often I outline them. Uh, but when I write anything else, I don't. I just start writing, you know, and I go go there. But this book, I realized, I, well, I had to use my talent in mysteries to come back to it and outline exactly who he was going to be, exactly where he was going to go. That was about maybe four years ago, four and a half years ago. And um, and I got it. I said, hey, I can write this book. I can, I can write it. I can put it in front of me. It's going to work. It's going to be, you know, what I want it to be. You know, whether or not people like it, it doesn't matter to me too much. But is it going to be what I want it to be? And 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 it was. I I, I followed it. I thought it. I saw. Hey, this is what John does. 
first you know they hire him at this university then he he has these experiences then he, you know and, and and it's like you you know like anybody in life like well okay this is this is the path i'm following i get this job i you know, pass this test i get to this position then i get to the next position then i invest some money here and then i do this you know but along the way he says well you know right but i was walking down the street and this motherfucker walk up to me and i kill him what does that mean I think that John doesn't understand who he is until he really experiences who he is. And that takes a while. Well, it's a remarkable book. Um, definitely one of my favorites that you've done so far. Yeah, very, you. very challenging. Um, so, everybody, if you haven't read John Woman, you're in for a real treat. If you think you know, uh, have, you had a, have you had a lot of good kind of interesting feedback from all sorts of different people about it that's great yeah um great yeah let's talk it's it's also great um let's get on track here uh to talk about uh, the reappearance talk about of, mysteries let's let's talk oh. about we'll talk about everything um to to we'll talk about the blues which uh plays a big role in this uh this wonderful new yeah. mm-hmm. novella that you've written do you consider this by the way uh the new leonid mcgill uh, novel? Do you consider it a novella or a novel, or is there a difference it's, in your mind? It's such a hard thing to to say. You know, I mean, you you have a definition of what something is. You know, like for instance, you know, a, a sonnet. So, well, it's fourteen lines, and it's either Petrarchan or it's English or you know the rhyming scheme. Or, you know, and you know you can go at you know go at it. In various ways and so okay that's what it is now of course it's a poem right so like what does the poem say what doesn't it say there's a lot of bad sonnets out there and there are a lot of unbelievable sonnets out there you know uh and 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 so the idea of saying the 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 structure of the definition of it is you know is one thing i started writing this book uh you know trouble is what i do based on a I don't. I don't know. The, the, the title is based on a on a on a semi quote from uh, uh, Sugar Ray Robinson. Did we talk about this before? It's yeah. It's in the book. I know that. Oh. Okay. Yeah. But but like you know, Robinson was asked by the judge uh, that, about a guy that he killed. Really, he says, "Well." Um, uh, uh, Robinson explains, said, well, you know, Your Honor, in the fourth round, I got him in trouble, and, you know, and I did this, and I did that, and, well, you know, you see what happened. And so the judge asked Robinson, really, in life, really, that he asked him, he says, well, did you get him in trouble on purpose? And he said, well, Your Honor, you know, getting people in trouble is what I do, <laughs> right? And so, like, like the notion, you know, like, you know, the, the notion of it, I, 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 I had that notion in my head, and I'm thinking about Leonid, and I'm thinking about the blues, and I'm thinking about how Leonid has passed through his life, and I'm thinking about his son, mm. and I wrote a book uh, with no chapters that, you know, it's like 40,000 words, something like that, you know. Um, so by definition, that's a novella, right? It feels to me like any novel I've written about Leonid Miguel. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the plot stuff I, you know, I I didn't skip over, but I I truncated, mm. and 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 I and, and which is easy to do when you don't have chapters. He's he's moving forward. His son is moving forward. Uh, his client is moving forward. He's trying to do stuff, and it, it, it's easier to like kind of like you know s- s- squash it down. Um, and so, yes, it's definitely a novella. And yes, it's definitely equal to any novel that Leonid McGill has ever experienced. Yeah, it's, and, it's funny. I yeah. love, I love, uh, I love the length. You know, I love short novels. I love, uh, mm-hmm. you know, there are so many writers. You know, James Salas comes to mind. Somebody who, mm-hmm. and a lot of, a lot of European writers. You know, will. We'll, write that in that short novel very compressed I just love that form um, you know with this novel you know I mentioned uh, you know there blues plays a enormously important role in this book um, perhaps in ways that 
you know, aren't blatantly on the surface, you know. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, there's kind of a connective tissue about, about the music. Uh, can you, yet at the same time, you know, uh, it's a, the setup is, is the classic kind of private eye setup. You know, the client mm -hmm. walks into the office. Without giving too much away, and then we'll kind of get into the meat and bones of it. Can you talk mm -hmm. about, can you talk about the, kind of the basic plot setup? Well, you know, it, it's, it's one, and, and really, this is one of those things that I didn't have to do what I did with John Woman. I didn't have to outline it. I just said, well, I'll just keep writing this. He, a guy walks in, and, you know, and he says, hey, you know, uh, this guy uh, told me to come here. And, and, and Lena says, this guy? And I go, yeah. He said, oh, and he remembers that th this guy, Ernie Eccles, is like a really major assassin, it, 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 as uh, dangerous and as powerful as Hush, his good friend, the other assassin. And he remembers when he had to come into conflict with Ernie Eccles. And, you know, and at the end of it, Ernie Eccles, you know, got the better of him and could have killed him, but instead gave him a, a drink of this whiskey that's 120 years old. Right. Yeah, have, have, have a sip of this. And Lena says, damn, that's the best whiskey I ever had. He said, I'm, I'm glad I got that because I know you're about to kill me. And he said, no, no, I ain't going to kill you. And he just leaves. And then many years later, you know, uh, you have, you know, a catfish worry comes to him and says, uh, I was sent to you, sent here by Ernie Eccles. And he goes, oh, well, that means I guess I have to do what you say. You know, and you have this really old black blues man in his 90s who says, I need you to deliver a, a letter to one of, you know, like, you know, uh, somebody who's even more important than the daughters of the American Revolution. Right. Somebody who's that white and that much, you know, tied up in, into our, our recognized history. And, you know, and, and Landon says, man, this, why, you know? And, you know, he has to do it because Ernie Eccles, you know, he owes Ernie Eccles something. And, but he wants to know why, and, and, it, and it has to do with his history, with this man's history, with America's history, and most importantly, with his son's and, and his assistant's history. Yes. And, and it all comes together in the blues, because the blues is, you know, is, is, is the language of America, certainly in the last half of the 19th and, and all of the 20th century. And still, you know, it's still today, you know, with rock, rock and roll, you know, with all, all that stuff, you know, uh, folk, uh, punk music, all of it, you know, blues is, is, is a continual, you know, tone in that. And it's an important thing for Leonid to understand about his own self and who, who he has been all these years, but it's also important, uh, an, an important mystery uh, crime to solve. And, you know, and even though Leonid guides the solution, he doesn't make the solution. It, it kind of harkens back a little bit, you know, of course, to your, your earlier book, R.L.'s Dream, you know. Um, mm. um, there's a, there's a, trying to articulate it, there, there's a remarkable scene kind of fairly early on in the book where, um, Lamont, uh, Catfish, mm -hmm. Catfish's son. His uh, great-grandson. Great-grandson, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's funny, I was thinking about R.L. Burnside a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Him and his son, the drummer that he used to play with. Um, yeah. there's, there's a wonderful scene when, uh, you know, Catfish is kind of off, off stage, as it were, talking with uh, Leonid, and he hears music coming in from the other, the other room. And from out of nowhere, you know, well, not from out of nowhere, from a very particular place, uh, his son and Marty are singing along, mm -hmm. and that was uh, that was just such a beautiful scene. Um, I it, I don't really have a question there, but it seems to me like <laughs> that, it seems to me like that's kind of the, for me anyway. There was the heart of the book, you know, uh, or. or Kind of the nucleus in a way that kind of comes back later yeah. uh, no i think so that that where where 
Leonid is, is wondering, should I be doing this work for Catfish Warrior? Because the, the people I'm going to be fucking with here, they can kill me. And, and there's not going to be any trouble in them killing me. He hasn't ha doesn't have any proof of that yet, but he already knows it. But then in the next room, you have uh, Lamont, Catfish's great-grandson. Uh, you have Twill, uh, uh, basically uh, 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 Leonid's adopted son, though you know he treats him as his blood son. And Marty, the, the young white girl who's had you know, so, much, so much grief in her life. And they're and they're singing the blues, and they just made up a blues song. Yeah, they're just singing it together. And Leonid comes out. He didn't know either one of them could sing, and and he didn't know how much these strains of the blues kind of played inside of him. And as soon as he hears hears this happen, he says, "I gotta do this. I have to do this. I don't want to do it. You know." Uh, I don't know what would happen if I don't if I do it and, and Ernie Eccles doesn't uh, you know like I don't want him to get him mad because he could kill me and but I have to do it not because of that but because the the young people in my life have connected me to a part of my history that I have ignored you know? and you know and I, I think that that's a real for, for me that's a history of America but it's also a history of black people in America where you know, yeah, if, if you have the kind of freedom to, you know, think about, you know, liberation and, and you know, uh, we shall overcome and all this stuff, great. If you're like Leonid, you know, who's been on his own since he was 14, you know, man, I don't have the time to worry about that shit, you know. You mess with me, I'm going to kill you. you. You mess with me, I'm going to get you one way or the other. I don't care if you're white or black or Chinese or Puerto Rican, it doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm going to take care of business, you know. And it's now much later in his life. He's in his 50s. He hears his, his uh, a son and, and, and his assistant and this man he doesn't even know singing this, this song, which, he, which is beautiful. He goes, shit, I, gotta, I, gotta, I have to change up here. And there's a, I'm tempted to read a little passage here, but that's, that, that's your job. <laughs> um, no, you can do it, please. There's, a, there's this little scene where, um, uh, I think it's on page 93, if you're following along at home. Uh, it says, uh, Lamont was like Catfish's mouthpiece. Uh, through him, Catfish was telling us how broken and misused him and his have been, how broken and misused all our people are. Uh, I hardly recognized myself in the words I was saying. Uh, and then his son, Quill, says, I never heard you say our people before, uh, echoing my inner confusion. And then just a short little bit more here. Uh, when I was a criminal most of Twill's life, I didn't have time for right and wrong. This is just what you were saying. People were on the run, getting thrown in the scrap heap of prison and hankering after revenge. Back then, <clears throat> excuse me, back then there was no such word as innocence in my lexicon. Mm -hmm. An innocent man or woman was simply the lucky one found not guilty, or better, never even charged. I couldn't think of my victims other than as a means to an end. I was so hardened to suffering that somehow even the casualties of history fell outside the borders of my self-imposed sovereignty. Wow. That's some heavy, <laughs> that's some heavy shit, man. Yeah, I know. I really, <laughs> maybe you should put those in mysteries, but you know, like at some point or another, you know, like what are you going to do, right? I yeah. Mean, you got a, you got a guy who's, uh, who comes from, from that incredibly complex place that race places everybody in America and most of us don't think about it. well yeah uh, it certainly plays into the new book um, and I won't give away in how um, <laughs> okay, but, uh, yeah right uh, but just just briefly a little bit more about Leonid here um, we you've given us little bits about his backstory throughout the books so far um, in this book we really learn a lot about how uh, you know his father's abandonment early in his life how much that's shaped and formed his character and who he's become and how he's survived uh, would you agree with that yeah you know absolutely his uh, he uh, he and his brother uh, were, were raised homeschooled by his father until he was 12 uh, the, the father leaves to go fight some war in Chile or somewhere in South America and, and uh, the, the mother stays and dies of a broken heart, and, and Leonid and his brother are on their own, and his brother Nikita. 
they're on their own. Um, he has deep lessons from his father that he, he always keeps, but at the same time, he kind of hates it. You know, and that hating of, you know, the, 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 fa the black son hating, you know, his, 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 uh, his black father is a kind of ha self hatred. And I think the self hatred that he's experienced, he, he, he goes through in this book. But, you know, he doesn't get away free because at some point or another, the, his wife tells him, says, well, you know, I've fallen in love with your father. <laughs> and it's like, why would you even tell me that? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting conundrum that you can't really escape, but you can understand. See, I told you the Greeks were everywhere. That's right. Just the, Greeks, the Greeks are in the story too, aren't they? That's right. In some sense. Um, also, I just wanted to ask you about about some of the wonderful names that you've used over the years, you know, in this particular one, cat, you know, Philip Catfish Worry, uh, mm -hmm. and then I'm thinking, wasn't the character in R.L. Stream was in it Soup Spoon Wise? Soup Spoon Wise, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Catwater Soup Spoon Wise. Yeah. And it's funny. I was talk. I was just talking with a, a really terrific writer named Brian Panowich, you know, who's out of Georgia. Um, great writer. We were talking about the Georgia blues, you know, the Piedmont blues guys, and how they mm -hmm. had the coolest names, you know, like uh, Barbecue Bob is my, one of my yeah. favorites, and uh, Peg Leg Howl, you know, just these wonderful names. Blind Willie McTell, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you come up with these names? Are they, I'm noticing a lot of W last names, too. Oh, well, they are? I, 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 hadn't thought, I hadn't thought about that. Um, you know, listen, you come up with names. I mean, the, it's the thing about the South. People make up names. It really is true. They just make up stuff. You know, they say, oh, well, you know, the, I, I bought this medicine at the drugstore and then, you know, and I read this book in the Bible. Let me see if I can put them both together and make a, you know, interesting name out of it. You know, I, I think that, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a creativity that I don't know why. I, it feels like it's more prevalent in the South than in the North. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but it feels like that. Um, you know, and, and, you know, and you just, you just like it because, you know, names, you know, names are, you know, they're the way that we understand ourselves. You know, I mean, even in, in, in psychoanalysis, I was talking to somebody about this yesterday. Um, you know, uh, Eric Erickson, whose original name wasn't Erickson. I don't know what his original name was, but he, he realized that his relationship with his father was, in a way wrong it, it didn't help him it didn't benefit him it was a, against his understanding of his self that his father's psychological issues whatever they were needed eric not to understand himself and so when he finally did understand himself he, he renamed himself eric eric's son because i am my own son you know and i and i and i think that that kind of way of going about doing things is uh is the way you know we, we feel things you know soup spoon wise is why we call them that it's like because you know i played the soup spoons you know when i was you know eight to the age of 12 i played soup spoons on my knees and after that you know i i did other things but i'm you know soup spoon wise you know you gotta have a handle right you gotta have a handle you gotta eat somebody gotta know you for who you are right yeah i really there's so, so many great names so like once you start playing them like one of my favorite names in the blues is sun house yeah. God, where do you get a name like that? S O N H O U S E. Not Son. Bad. And he was the joint. He he was damn, he was great. He sure was. <coughs> you know, um I mean I love this this is a particular obsession of mine, you know, and uh I find the Charlie Patton to be a really compelling dude, mm -hmm. you know. This guy that was apparently was such a great guitarist. Yeah all that percussive beating on the guitar and you know <coughs> apparently mostly american indian isn't that right from what they say um, yeah that's what they say that's what yeah like. yeah but sun house wasn't he uh when they had that great <coughs> that great kind of rediscovery in the 60s early late 50s early 60s <coughs> i'm gonna get some water sure i'm gonna come back and answer that all right <coughs> sorry folks we're kind of nerding out here on the blues a little bit but why not? 
it's hard to say. For somehow, some people said <coughs> that he um, had some kind of like somebody put a spell on him or something, and he, and he left the blues because he thought I was going to kill him. Mm. Other people said that so many people around him, like Robert Johnson, other people died that he just gave it up, moved up to New York to get away from it. Rochester, it's hard to Rochester right? <coughs> Rochester, <coughs> and then he was rediscovered. He was working as a janitor, yeah. from what I hear. Yeah. yeah. And so many of those guys, you know, like Skip James and, you know, uh, you name it. Uh, gosh. All those guys. Um, you know, who I also find is find is, is, is so cool is uh, Lightning Hopkins. doesn't get much cooler than that. Kenny Terry, Brandon McGee, Lightning Hopkins, all those guys, they were so great. And, they, you know, they weren't the top level, you know, they weren't, you know, you know Muddy Waters, they weren't a Howlin' Wolf or a Sun House, but great, great musicians. Fred you know? McDowell. Yeah. And they created the American, I mean, they created 20th century music. Well, <coughs> to get back kind of vaguely on track, not that there is a track, because um, I'm just going to take it in another weird direction, I'm sure, but, you know, let's talk about Easy Rollins a little bit. Um, I understand uh, the word on the street is you might have a new one coming, uh, or might be working uh, on one. Yeah, Blood Grove. Ooh. It's a new Easy Rollins novel, 1969 L.A. Ooh. <clears throat> Easy decides to represent a, 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 a vet of Vietnam who, who thinks he might have killed somebody but doesn't know. At least that's what he tells Easy. And Easy starts to solve, you know, to solve that crime because he understands that, you know, he was a, he was a veteran. He, he had the same experience that this guy had. And he had to, even though he's a white guy, he has to represent. <clears throat> and so it's a, it's a really, it's a fun book. I mean, where Easy lives, for me, is like worth the whole book. Uh, Mouse, who's changed immensely from the last time to this time, is just, you know, it's just it's just wonderful. Easy's happy when Mouse says to him, oh man, you gotta kill that dude. He said, I was so happy to hear him say he killed somebody, at least he was normal, you know? <laughs> um, dealing with his daughter, dealing with his daughter's family. Um, it's a, it, it, it was really a, a really fun book for me to write. I, I finished it, you know, maybe a month and a half ago or something. I sent it to the publisher. Comes out next year. When, when was the last, the last Easy Rollins uh, in time? Was it 68 or 67? Six, see, one of the two, I forget which. Yeah. Actually, 60, I think probably 68. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because, um, you know, I was born in, in October of 69 in Los Angeles. Yeah. My grandfather was a LAPD cop back in the 40s. And, um, mm. you know, uh, that whole time, the late 60s, and I hear my mom talk about it now, just how in LA it was uh, just, you know, she would talk about going to work uh, downtown and seeing all the Manson followers around the courthouse, you know, uh -huh. when, when Charlie was <clears throat> in his trial. You know, it was just a crazy, fascinating time. Well, you know, and, and it's fascinating in different ways for different people. Easy in this in the beginning of this novel has just finished a, a, a job for this very very rich guy, but in finishing the job, his, his money goes into probate, and so he can't pay Easy. But he has this really expensive Rolls Royce, <clears throat> and so he signs it over to Easy for one year for one dollar, and he says, "If I don't pay you at least sixty thousand at the end of this time, uh, you can keep the car." <clears throat> Easy loves it. He's driving a Rolls Royce around L.A., but he realizes that the police keep stopping him, and that he can't do his job because the police are stopping him. and say, "Man, what are you doing? And, 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 and you know, what are you doing driving a Rolls Royce? Yeah, you know, let's see your, you know, this and this." And, and Easy said, "Man, I'm not even the same town you represent." And then the cop looks at him and says, "Ain't you that nigger?" And Easy looks back at him and says, "What what nigger is that?" You know, it's like, that's his experience, right? You know, so like, we all have different experiences of LA and there's no and there's no reason or ex excuse about it or anything like that. <clears throat> it's just that if you're black in Los Angeles, now I can I can change my language to fit, you know, white people in, in uh, or, and black people 
in LA in 2020. But if you were in LA in 1969, nobody says, oh, aren't you an African American? Nobody said that. Right. You know, and they wouldn't say, it. even if they knew they could say it, they wouldn't say it. And so, you know, th there's an experience that you have that, you know, and, and a political correctness wants you to you know, say, well, you, <clears throat> you can't say that. And I'm saying, really? What, what, what? I can't, I can't say what people have been saying to me for 400 years? That, well, no, because it's wrong. And you be committing a crime saying that. And I'm going, well, I, you know, I hope that freedom of speech, you know, lasts me longer than that, you know, because uh i need to say what people said you know <clears throat> which is one of the great things about you know robert johnson uh, lightning hopkins uh, muddy waters you, you know you, you know uh all all the, the great i mean the, i mean one of the great things about art is truth you know so well, well, what did he say you know and you don't change what he said you said what he said you know that's really you know it's great <laughs> You know, well, it's funny. You know, with uh, your first your first published novel, The Devil in the Blue Dress. You know, that was obviously a, a groundbreaking novel in so many ways. Um, in the sense that, well, in all different <clears throat> senses, but you know, we'd been given we knew that era from the white perspective. You know, we we read right. Raymond Chandler, we read mm -hmm. Nathaniel West. Oh, you know, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, Ross McDonald a little bit later, you know, we knew those streets and that story from that Dorothy B. Hughes, another neglected one. Uh, um, yeah, Dorothy, great. But then, you know, to, you really showed us, you took us down into the Central Avenue scene and, you know, you showed us the, the city that was existing that we haven't been shown um, to a large extent, you know, little bits and pieces here and there, but not anything like you did. Um, just let's can we talk just for a few minutes and I'll see if we have any questions uh, hey. from the audience. I'm sorry to dominate this whole thing, but there's so much stuff I like to talk to you about. Let's talk about uh, Walter, the portrait of the artist as a young man. I'm curious. To, <laughs> I'm curious to know uh, uh, what were you like as a young man? Where, did you always know that uh, you were going to be a writer? Or did, I know you were a computer no. computer tech guy. Um, well, I, I, I work with computers, but I mean, that has nothing to do with anything, but okay. I, I didn't have any idea what I was going to be. You know, I'm from California, like you, from L.A. So, you know, I mean, it, it takes longer to, you know, you say, well, I could do this, I could do that. I was I was in my mid-30s before I realized I could be a writer, and I thought, wow, maybe I'll try to do that. You know, I was in New York by then, a computer programmer working for Mobile Oil, but I said, well, let me write some, you know, words. And, and you know, it ended up me being, you know, what I am today. But it, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a long, a long road. I love thoughts and ideas. I studied political theory. I was in a doctoral program at U UMass Amherst uh, for, you know, political theory. Uh, I love that stuff. I love thinking. I love talking. But I, it, it never cohesed until I started, you know, writing. When I started writing, uh, the truth of what I, you know, I had experienced, and my family had experienced, my people had experienced started to come out <clears throat> and uh and this was in your what your 20s or early 30s uh, 30s 30s I was in my 33 34 35 like that yeah wow well you certainly made up for lost time um you're, you're always got multiple projects going on um you know and as i said before with uh talking referring to you as a man of letters that's one of the things that i, I really admire about your career is that you know you do you follow your own path, you know, and you write science speculative fiction, mystery fiction, nonfiction, essays. Do you, uh, when are you going to write a Western? Or have you already? You no, know, I, I have written a thing called Showdown on the Hudson. It's contemporary. Uh, I, I have a book coming out uh, in September called The Awkward Black Man. That story is in The Awkward Black Man. It's, a, it's about a, a young cowboy from down in Texas whose you know, mother has to leave Texas because some, some guy is giving her grief. She moves to uh, Harlem. And in Harlem, you know, he, they, they, they love this guy. You know, he rides horses. He has these beautiful pearl handle guns and holsters and stuff. And, he's in, and he believes in the cowboy way, like many black people do in Texas. You know, I'm a cowboy, you know, I believe in, in, you know, in honor and the truth and poetry and, you know, all this stuff. 
Uh, and, but he ends up uh, another cowboy from a white cowboy from Tennessee and him, you know, have an altercation and they end up having a, a showdown on the Hudson. It's the closest so far I've got to a Western, but I really, I really love it. Wow. So in that, that book, you can look at it when the book comes out in uh, September, you know, it's called Showdown on the Hudson. I'm, 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 I'm very happy that I did that. You know? Is, is so, that coming from Grove Atlantic? <laughs> Grove Atlantic. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that reminds me a little bit of what, what you were saying of with what Attica Locke is doing with those that series that she's writing. Have you read mm -hmm. Bluebird, Bluebird, and in those books? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Not, absolutely. Terrific stuff. Um, there's also, I don't know mm -hmm. if you're aware of. Um, I'm sure you are, but uh, one of my favorite writers that I always like to give a plug to because nobody really knows about him um, is Percival Everett. And, oh, uh, wow. he's a great writer. Yeah, and he has that wonderful Western that is called, I think it's called God's Country that he wrote. Mm -hmm. You should look it up if you haven't read it. And it's a Western. Yeah, Terrific. Um, uh, and Percival is such a wonderful writer, and he, and he, and he, you know, he has such, so much humor in the writing, which is, you know, is the hardest thing to do, you know, like to, to write something that's, that has humor to it, you know, which kind of precludes melodrama. You know, you can have serious dramatic stuff, but if you know, in the, in the middle is melodrama. And then you have humor over here. And humor, you know, I don't know, it just, it makes you happy. And, and, and it makes the human experience something other than, you know, they want us to have, you know. Yeah, well, he, he reminds me of, of you in a sense that he never does really the same thing twice, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, he, he's a wonderful writer. he had that book called Kind, uh, I, I want to say Kind of Blue, but that's Miles Davis. So Much Blue. They came out mm -hmm. a few years ago. Oh, it was just a stunning piece of work. Um, and then that earlier book, Glyph, told from the point of view of a, a super genius baby. You know, just a wonderful satire. Um, what else do you have in the works? Any? I know you got tons of projects going. You know, I have the Easy Rollins, uh, you know, Blood Grove, and I have, you know, uh, you know, I'm 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 gonna write a you know a new new book from you know uh, you know from my you know, down the river you know uh, yeah. uh, group of characters. Um, I'm working right now with Sam Jackson to do uh, the the last days of Ptolemy Gray with uh, you know with Apple TV, uh, and you know there's a movie The Man in My Basement that I'm I'm doing with an English company. Oh really? Uh, yeah, right now. Wow. You know the so, yeah. You know, you know, I, and there's probably other things too. You know, I'm writing. You know, right now I'm just writing a series of, you know, a, a, a second series of stories having to do with the awkward black man. I just, I love that idea because you know, there's so many, you know, characters. You know, there's so many characters in Black Life that are left out. You know, because you know, you know, there's a caricature kind of notion. Well, uh, they shine shoes. They 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 uh, deal drugs. They're pimps. They're uh, they're my best friend. You know, like that kind of stuff. You know. And you know, there's so many other people we could be, and you know, so so I've been I've been you know kind of concentrating on that as you know a series of stories and a series of things that I can do. I just it's funny, my wife uh, Sandra, I just gave her, she was you know when I was reading John Woman, telling her how wonderful it was, I said, "You've never read Mosley, have you?" And she goes, "No, I don't think so." And so I went to my shelf and I pulled down a copy of uh, Always Outnumbered, Always Outgunned. Mm -hmm. And I gave it to her, and she's really loving that book. Um, and so yeah, Socrates right. has a special place in my heart, and I'm sure a lot of readers' hearts. I've asked you this every time, and you say, you know, someday the Spirit will move me to do another book about Socrates. Uh, yeah, and, and really, and, and it's true, you know. I mean, so far, you know, because you really have to, Socrates, you really have to, you know, like if you're a boxer and you're fighting somebody, and you say, well, listen, I can't, I can't just beat them. I got to knock them out. You got to plant your feet. You got to plant your feet. So when you throw a punch, they feel it. Uh, Socrates is like that. I got to plant my feet, you know, in order to write a, a, a lot of other people, you know, I can play around with, you know, easy, fearless Jones, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Leonid McGill, uh, but Socrates is, he's like a, a whole other level of drama that, uh, you really have to stop because, you know, Socrates has been through some shit, and you know, so you have to. Well, okay, where is he? Where is he now? You know. It's funny because I can, in my mind, I can picture him in kind of Leon, Leonid occupying the same space in some ways. You know. 
No, it's true. But Leonid has, you know, so much more. You know, he, he never went to prison. He has a wife. He has children, either that are his or not his, but he identifies with all of them. You know, he has a he has a, a, a culture and a society um, that Leonid doesn't have. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, Socrates. Socrates, Socrates doesn't have. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I I really thought that the uh, HBO adaptation they did with um, uh, Natalie Cole and um, Fishburne, right? Yeah, oh, Cecily that, Tyson, Fishburne, yeah, a lot of people. Isaiah that was, I really thought that was well done. Did you Did you enjoy it? Listen, I like it more than I like Devil in a Blue Dress. Really? Yeah, I, I really. When you, and the reason is, it's not that it's a better movie than, than Devil, but it is more unique. Like, there's, there's no movie like it. When you watch it, you go, what am I watching? Yeah. What's oh, what? Huh? You know, it, 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 it's because it's, it's, you know, because he's such a, an original character. Yeah. Yeah. Where did, where did uh, somebody like Socrates come from in your, in your mind? Did you just kind of, did it come out of, uh, did you have the, the, the historical character of Socrates in the back of your mind? Well, here's what it is. When I, very early in my career, I was writing these mysteries and people said, we're going to, you know, you're Jewish and you're black and so what we're going to do is we're going to put you on a tour of Southern Jewish book festivals. And I went, okay. And it was like six of them, you know? And I said, that's great because, you know, I know everybody is going to buy the book. Everybody's going to have read the book before I got there. It's going to be, you know, I'll be proud. It'd be fun. And, but in every place in the front row on the left side, there was three, you know, older women, uh, my age now, but you know, back then they were older women and, and they were saying, uh, we, we, we like your books, but, you know, when we see where your father's in the book, where's your mother? And I said, well, you know, I think it was, I think it was Black Betty, the, the book I was going for, and, and they went, and I said, well, you know, I mean, my mother did this, my mother did that. They said, no, 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 we know, because Easy was reading Hadrian. That's your mother. And I'm saying, well, you know, to begin with, Hadrian isn't Jewish. And secondly, black people think, but they didn't, they knew who my mother was, so they weren't going to change the way they were thinking. And so I thought I needed a black philosopher that those three ladies would like, but they wouldn't claim. And that's where I came up with Socrates. I said, you know, what, 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 you know, is it somebody in, uh, who went to university? No. Is it somebody who is a, 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 a you know, a, a, a minister? No. You know, yeah. And I came through a whole bunch of things. I said, the only thing he can be is they went to the black men's prison, which is. Blackman's University, which is prison, and um, and and that's where I came up with uh, Socrates. Twenty-seven years in prison, comes out, and has to change himself, not because of what he needs, but because of what a young man needs. Yeah. Now, just skipping back to Leonid for a second, um, we didn't really get into Twilium, uh, yeah. but uh, tell us a little bit about him and and what, you know, kind of the direction that he might be heading. Or seems to be heading. I have no idea where it's going to go, uh, but he is—he's like my ideal character, even more than Mouse. He's my ideal character. He's—he—he's uh, he, he's a sociopath, but lovable. He will do anything uh, to achieve what he thinks is the right end in the world. But he's not like Mouse. He's not angry. He just lives. He just lives a life. You know. He's uh, smarter than his father. Uh, he's incredibly good at what he does. But in the end, uh, he's who we will ultimately need to be to survive the world we're living in. Well, you're kind of taking us in a direction here that I was going to ask you about. I mean, there's so much going on right now in the world. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost, I hesitate to even bring it up, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, we've asked a couple of, of authors this question about how, you know, going forward in, their, in, in your writing, um, are you thinking ahead to, well, there's no way to avoid this, you know, going forward in fiction and how I, you know, writing things that are set, Anytime past 2020, 
Any thoughts there? Um, I, I, don't, I don't completely understand that question. Well, um, the question is, have you thought, you know, we're constantly kind of analyzing and, and looking at the situation that we all find ourselves in, you know, and, mm -hmm. and how, you know, how the powers that be are responding or fail, comprehensively failing to respond to mm -hmm. this pandemic and what it reveals about the system and, you know, all kinds of questions mm -hmm. like that. You know, I'm, I'm like, you know, and I, I'm actually thinking about writing an op-ed piece about this nowadays, but what, what, what interests me most is how we can be optimistic about where we are. You know, you look at, you look at uh, the quarantine and you say, wow, if you look at the sky, the air is clearing up. If you look at the ocean, the ocean is clearing up. If, 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 if you look at, at people's lives, some people, not everybody, but some people are actually discovering new things about themselves. If you look at, at, at why we're under quarantine, so we're under quarantine because of a disease that's killing a certain very small percentage of the population, though it's a particular percent, uh, uh, part of the population. You could say, um, well, God, this is great. It's so much better than if Ebola had hit Chicago now. If Ebola hits Chicago in 10 years, we'll actually know what to do. You know, there, there's so many ways that we can look positively at, you know, uh, even something, you know, like, you know, so, you could say social distancing, but leave out distancing. It's just something social. We're doing things for each other. Right. I think all of that is uh, extraordinarily potentially positive. And it, it's where I want to be, you know, the idea, you know, listen, when the, when the bubonic plague hit a town anywhere from the 12th to the 15th century, 60% of the population died. That's like 60% died, you know, like that's some serious stuff right there. Right. I mean, it's like 60%, you know, I, you know, uh, the, the, you know, so-called Spanish flu, the, the, you know, uh, you know, the uh, Ebola, all of these things, you know, this is a really bad, bad moment and it, it's hard for a lot of people. And, and, and there's a lot of things that we don't know, but rather than blaming it, like ignorance, it's like, I know that I'm no more, uh, no less ignorant than all the other people who are making decisions. I would. I would probably make a lot of the same mistakes, but making mistakes, you know, as an artist, you say, well, listen, I learned from my mistakes and that's, what's, that's, what's good. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that, 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 that we can see a world that's much more positive than, than what we're thinking it is, you know, because we're, because, you know, the thing we're upset about is that our regular every day has been uh, disturbed. Right. Okay. But, you know. Yeah, it's funny. It, it, it does kind of, it, there's a lot of opportunity there, you know, to kind of yeah. reshape things in a different way. Um, you know, and as horrific as, as it is, the reason behind mm -hmm. it, you know, it does make you think, you know, where is this rampant consumerism, you know, constant drive yeah. to acqu acquire and you know, where is that really taking us? And can we, you know, kind of step, well, no. yeah. Yeah, 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 kind of step back from it and, you know, there are a lot of books and there are a lot of books in my house and I'm sure in your house that you haven't read yet. And it <laughs> takes, yeah. you can look around and rediscover what you've got, you know. And you can understand where you are. Yeah. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a lot to it, you know, that, that you know, that, that, you know, and, and people are approaching it in different ways, you know, and I, I didn't want to get mad at them. You know, somebody says, well, listen, I got my freedom. I said, okay, fine. You know, you got your freedom. Maybe, you know, uh, you know, uh, the herd thing will work with you. I don't, I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, it, it's like, there, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting world. And I'm, I'm, not, you know, I'm, I'm not happy it's happening, but I, I am, I'm saying, well, what can we get out of where we are? You know, um, we live in, you know, we've discovered, you know, even those of us who didn't know, we live in a really small world. A, a disease, you know, happens here in October, 
And by December 13th, it's, you know, halfway around the world. You know, that's, that's some serious stuff right there. You know, it's like, whoa, it, what, you know, and, you know, even to understand feeling that the world is that much smaller, you know, makes us that much closer. There's all kinds of stuff we can do with that. You know, so I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, to say, well, this is really terrible. This is really bad. Cause you know, a lot of people say this is bad because it's not the way it used to be, but you know, that's the truth. It's not the way it used to be. There's nothing I can do about that. If we didn't have airplanes, then the disease couldn't move really fast, but it, we do have airplanes. So they do, you know, so like, you know, what do we do about that? You know, how do we prepare? How do we take care of each other? What is our economy like? All of that stuff, you know? How are the how are the highways or the freeways in LA? Well, you know, uh, six weeks ago they were empty. Now they're you know they're at kind of half capacity. You know, because you know people have gotten tired of being inside. You know, a lot of people can't you know, and that's another thing where a lot of people can't be alone, can't sit in their house and write and draw, and think, and watch and you know read and re you know re reconsider. You know, a lot of people got to be out there with other people. You know, so okay. Well, you know, if you got that's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. Who is that? Uh, uh, that great quote: um, "All of un all of man's unhappiness stems from his inability to sit quietly in his room." Um, yeah, yeah. I think Pascal, maybe something like that. Is that Pascal? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and but but that is many of us. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, it's like, and you have to you have to deal with that. You have to say, okay. I can't just run up to these people and say they're awful because they're not able to be like me. I can say, okay, how do we deal with that? You know? Just checking to see if I have any questions here. Um, sorry, everybody, for dominating this conversation. Um, That's right. Kind of flying solo here, so I'm doing it all. Uh, let's see. I have a customer who asks. Um, I guess you've already covered this, really, which was, you know, what was the inspiration for your main character, uh, Leonid McGill? You talked a little bit about that. Uh, anything further you'd like to add? Well, it's so interesting writing about Leonid, you know, because like, I wrote a short story uh, for Otto Penzler, uh, one of the collections that he was doing, about, you know, it's just about a woman uh, character, and I, and I wrote about a woman named uh, Karma, and, you know, that wasn't her name, but, you know, that's what she called herself, and and, and Leonid, early on in his criminal career, had set her father up, sent him to prison, and he was killed in prison. And she was willing to do this thing where she was going to uh, frame Leonid for a crime, and the crime would be her own murder. And rape and murder, actually. And Leonid figured out at the very end what was happening. She was already dead. Uh, the, the killer was, or, you know, there, he kills the killer. Um, and from that was the revelation, hey, I've been living my life wrong. If, if somebody will hate me enough to kill themselves, to destroy me, I've been living my life wrong. And I, and I think it was just that. Otto had asked me to write a story about a femme fatale. And, you know, and I, I took the word, you know, like, you know, the name femme fatale for what it meant, you know, woman death, and, um, and then created Leonid. Huh? Now, wasn't that kind of a, a variation on that? Didn't that come into uh, one of the novels uh, down by the river? Am I mistaking it? Kind of a femme fatale character who sort of traps. Uh, right, but not, but not tries to kill. Not kill the same herself. way. Yeah. yeah. Um, Oh, hell. Uh, uh, David asks, um, very good question, which is, uh, John Woman was such a unique and brilliant book. What made Mr. Mosley decide to write that? And we really did kind of get into that in depth, too, but uh, I'm not sure if you have you anything know, to add. You know, Down the River is a, it was an interesting book because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a new book that, that, that covers jazz, you know, you know, you know his name, you know, you know, is King Oliver, you know, and, and he's, you know, and he, and he's, he's a person who's, who's been, uh, really mistreated, uh, by the system, literally by the system, the, 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 the police system, by the political system of New York city. And he, and he survived it. 
and in surviving uh, the, the, the attacks by, by the system that he's, that he's lived by, he's become a new kind of person, which, you know, I really had all kinds of fun. To tell you the truth, I have no idea why I wrote that book. Nobody asked me to write it. I was just sitting around saying, well, I don't have anything else to do. I, I'll write a book, uh, you know, and, I'll call, and King Oliver will be the detective, you know. But uh, when I got to the end of it, I was very happy, you know. I'm going to write another one. I've, I've actually sold one, you know. Uh, uh, but we'll, we'll see. You know, we'll see. I haven't written it yet. So. King Oliver, what a great name. You know? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, he, he, taught, he taught Louis Armstrong how to play, you know. And uh, just uh, can't so beat that. Since we're just kind of talking, um, what what kind of jazz music do you like? Do you have uh, do you have favorites that you listen to, or is there a period that well, you like? I mean, jazz is so interesting, you know, and, and it exists, you know, all the various history of it, you know, you know, starting with somebody like Scott Joplin, you know, and then and going all the way through, you know, till you know till today, you know, it, it's um, you know jazz, you know, certainly between the '40s and maybe just grazing the '80s. It was the the major music, you know, of of the world, you know, that anybody, you know, somebody like you know deep 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 in Eastern Europe, like Django Reinhardt, mm. you know, he said, hey, I'm a jazz musician, you know, or go way 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 in the past, you know, Bach, you know, hey, I'm a jazz musician, you know, it's like, you know, it's 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 an interpretation of 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 the of the soul through jazz, you know. Or someone That's like old. someone like Robert Johnson too, definitely with uh, you know the complex. You know, the, blues, you know, the the jazz, jazz couldn't exist without the blues. Yeah, you know, I mean that's that's one of the interesting things. I mean, jazz is very different because it's got the combination of American music and also the history of of you know so-called classical music in in, in Europe. You know, but uh, but it, it could never have, you know you know come to 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 fruition without you know the blues, you know, and and, and and the blues couldn't have existed without gospel. You know? And you get someone like Lonnie Johnson, you know, who kind of comes mm -hmm. up and straddles both worlds. You know, yeah, crooner, jazz, but wonderful blues. Um, so when it comes to jazz, what are, what do you listen to? Do you have any favorites that you go back to again and again? Well, you know, I, I love Thelonious Monk. You know, I, you know, I, there's just something about Thelonious that. Um, I don't know. I, you know, it it's classic in a way, but then in an, another way, it's kind of crazy. You know, it's kind of like everything falls apart. You know, and and you know, you you watch him, and you know, you watch him in his life fall apart. Yeah. You know, there's there's nothing. You know, it's like, I mean, you could feel bad about it. It's it's like people tell me that they feel bad about Muhammad Ali. What what if he didn't do all that? You know, I said, well, if he didn't do all that we wouldn't have what we have, you know? I mean, we would have lost something without Muhammad Ali, you know? Say, so, yeah, but you know, I mean, no, you, you know, yeah, Parkinson's, yeah, this and that. I say, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, right, exactly. But... He lived a life, though, didn't he? Well, he, he lived the world's life, you know? And that's, you know, that becomes like, you know, an extraordinary moment. Well, I mean, someone like Thelonious Monk, you know, you hear, you hear the term genius bandied about a lot, you know, mm -hmm. but... There's a guy who, you know, made up his an, an entirely new language, you know, um, yeah. and watching him play the guitar, you know, or play the piano with his fingers yeah. and with the fingers all splayed and yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah. And yeah, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie had something to do with that, but but he had something to do with them too. I mean, it was it was a you know it was another thing, you know. He'd be sitting there, you know. I mean, they were all I mean, they were all so brilliant back then, you know. I mean, all of them, Parker, you know, Gillespie. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Thelonious, and you know, and two dozen other people. You know, it, it's just amazing how they spoke about the world. You know, inside their music. Well, I mean, you know, somebody who I really love, who who's starting to get some attention, is Eric Dolphy. You know, mm -hmm. Dolphy, um, wonderful. Uh, yeah. You know, and these guys, they, I think he died when he was twenty-eight years old. Or mm -hmm. you look at Charlie Christian or somebody like that. You know, just these revolutionary figures with these very short, short life, lives. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's that, that thing, you know, I mean. Does your taste, uh, you know, I think we both probably, I'm dialing in on this, that we both probably love that bebop period, you know, in the mid, late 50s through the 60s. 
Well, I love it passionately, but you know, I also go back, you know, I was, I was talking to a friend of mine and I was saying, you know, one of the things that upsets me is that people don't talk enough about Fats Waller, you know, cause Fats Waller, he was just, I mean, he could play that piano. I mean, really, all you need to really hear was a piano, but also his lyrics were outrageous. Some of them were incredibly, incredibly funny. Some were really romantic. Um, but you know, I, I was talking to my friend and my friend said, well, you know, uh, Fats Waller is not jazz, but he's blues. And, and he said that because Fats Waller plays stride piano. Uh, and stride piano is defined as blues piano. But he wasn't playing the blues, you know? Uh, you know, I mean, that, that thing, here we are out of cigarettes, holding hands and yawning, see how late it gets. Two sleepy people by dawn's early light, much too much in love to say goodnight. Now, that's not the blues. That's like, you know, that's, you know, that, that's, a, that's a lyric for, for like a jazz song, you know, that, you know, a, you know, a, a, a vocalist would sing that. Um, I mean, I just, I, I love him, you know, and, and certainly, you know, somebody like, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, the, uh, Louis Armstrong, you know, but and lots of, lots of musicians from that, you know, 30s to 50s place were extraordinary people and you couldn't you couldn't have bebop without them well what about you know it's funny you mention um do you see somebody like professor Longhair or uh fats domino you know uh, as kind of extensions of what waller was doing well yeah you know and then and then but reaching into you know to um, different place and blues rock and roll like you know like you know that whole stuff but you know all this stuff is related you know like at some point or another like you know Jimi Hendrix was you know lived and was playing today he'd be playing jazz there's no question that's what everybody says yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, there's just no question about that you know all of these you know these people are talking to each other it's it's just like country music or folk music you know you can't live yeah I mean we can't live without folk music. We can't live without country music. You know, it's like, and 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 there's nothing in country and folk that doesn't have at least part of its roots in in black music in America. You know, they, they don't know it, but it's true. And there's that whole kind of Celtic strain in a lot of it too. Well, the English have such an important, such an impact on us. You know, uh, and and they they sang some serious blues mm. in England. You know. And, you know, it's just like, you know, because they, I mean, they invented class, you know, then, you know, and it's like, they, you, the, the modern, the modern concept of class and, 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 you know, and so, you know, there are all these poor people who live like that, you know, there's Michael Caine has this documentary, uh, I forget the name of it, but it's about, it's about the time, you know, when, 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 when the, when the, you know, the Cockneys and, you know, took over music you it's know a doc documentary yeah it's a documentary uh My michael kane i forget the name of it how long what, did it, is it fairly old or has it been out for no, a while? pretty recent uh huh. let me see well not to not to derail you but you know you think of flamenco music you know and that gypsy music there's a whole lot of blues in there too uh no absolutely no, there, there, I mean, there is, I, I'm, I'm look, I'm like, listen, I, I got to look up this thing. Yeah. Uh, my generation, it's called 2017. Okay. My generation, my generation. And he, and he just talks about everybody, you know, like uh, Twiggy, all the people came, you know, like they, they came from just a language group that couldn't make it in England until then, hmm. you know, I mean, you know, when you start to think about the, the history of, of race and class and all, you know, stuff, you know, we didn't invent it in America. I mean, slavery is was, was such a tough thing. You know, I mean, it's so horrendous. But, and it's, it's one of the reasons that, you know, black people in America say, listen, we had it worse than anybody. Well, maybe that's true, actually, if, 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 as long as you don't include Native Americans getting, you know, uh, you know genocided. But um, the, the, the idea uh, that, you know, that everybody, you know, has this experience either they're on top or they're in the middle or they're on the bottom, you know, and, you know, and, 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 and music and music talks about it because the more you feel the pain, the more the pain enters your music, you know, 
And that pain entering your music is always the blues. It's always the blues. You know? So, you know, and, even if you're a Fairport convention or, uh, you mm -hmm. know, some of those late 60s, Nick Drake and stuff like that, tuning into the, into the blues in some weird ballad tradition. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, we digress. Um, yes, we do. But uh, I, I've just been having such a, a lot of fun talking with you today, Walter. Well, it's nice to talk to you, yeah. I really appreciate it. And um, I'm going to let the, the good people who've been sticking with us on Facebook Live, I'm going to go ahead and let them go. Um, uh -huh. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And um, we will see you soon. Mm -hmm. Turn this off.